Okay, so now the recording has started. Okay, so first of all, you have a question that why study computer architecture or organization? You may think that, you know, I want to do something in software, I want to do into, I want to go to Amazon, I want to go to Sprinkler, I want to go to Google. So then, you know, do I need to know computer architecture? Or do I need to know computer organization? Then, you know, there is also something which might be bothering you. That, you know, where does computer architecture, if I want to just do software, computer architecture sounds like hardware, so do I really need it? Well, when you go out to buy a computer, when I say computer, I means either you go out to buy a laptop or a mobile phone, I mean, there are a certain number of things, you know, you would be looking at. You would be looking at what kind of processor you are getting. Are you getting i7, Intel i7, Intel i5, Intel i3, which one is better? Can, how better is Intel i7 over Intel i5? Then second thing you would be looking at is what kind of RAM do I need? Do I need 8 GB of RAM or do I need 16 GB of RAM? You may not be paying attention to the cache memory that, you know, do I need 1 MB of cache? Do I need half an MB of cash? I mean, those things you will learn as this course progresses. You will learn that figuring out how much cash memory you have is even more important than just having some certain amount of RAM. Then, you know, probably if you buy a mobile phone, then, you know, apart from the size and apart from the brand name, again, you know, you say what kind of uh, processor you're using. Is it a Snapdragon uh, soft? Does it have, or, you know, if you are into gaming, you will also be wondering about, you know, what kind of uh, graphics processor you have. I mean, of course, you think NVIDIA is a must have or even AMD is good. But, you know, do I need 2 GB uh, card or 4 GB card? Or, you know, what should I have? So those kind of questions would all, always be. Always. Yes, any question? Okay, if you don't have any questions, then, you know, keep your mic muted. I mean, I always welcome you guys to interrupt me and ask a question. Uh, but if the question is not relevant to this class, then, you know, please keep, keep yourself muted. Because, you know, you must have seen a lot of post things posted over the net that, you know, how people make a fool of themselves if they forget to mute themselves and then talk about personal things. You guys don't want to end up on the social media, so let's not do that. Okay, so then, you know, we come to this part. But, you know, I hear about so many things. CPU, we all know that, you know, this is a central processing unit is something which is required. So we talk about CPU, it is like i7 CPU or i5 CPU. Then there is GPU. Okay, quite a few of you or most of you would be familiar with GPU, that is graphics processing unit. And you know, you know about NVIDIA, you know about uh, AMD. Then there is DSP, digital signal processor. Then very recently, you hear about neural processing unit because AI is becoming more and more relevant nowadays. So there is NPU. There is Field Programmable Gate Array, or FPGA. And then there is Bionic Chip by Apple. So what are all these things? You know, they all call some kind of processing unit or a processor. So how, what is the interplay? And if I want to be a programmer, how are these things going to help me? So let me uh, drop a kind of a, a picture which would make you aware that how your software programming skills and these hardware elements are work in very close conjunction. Let us say you are designing a video game. You know, video game designing is becoming uh, 
a huge industry, a multi-billion dollar industry. Or, you know, you might be even in uh, uh, some kind of augmented reality or uh, virtual reality kind of thing, you know, which are part of Hollywood films. Again, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. And, you know, you are designing a video game where a character throws a bomb, a hand grenade or whatever you have. That is a large sound. And then, you know, some characters fall off in different directions, some trees fall down, some objects fall over. And then you get your result that, you know, some character has died or some uh, thing object which you're trying to shoot has been shot. So how do these things play the part? Because as you may say that, you know, graphics processor is something, you know, which renders graphics on your screen. Then DSP, maybe something with the sound. And CPU is like a manager. So, you know, it must be doing something. So what is the interplay of all these things? So let me give you a kind of a breakdown of this. Your CPU is like your general manager, or it is like an admin unit. It is an overall command of your uh, computer. GPU and DSP are special purpose processors. Graphics processor is mainly into building up pixels and building up images on your screen, be it your laptop or your mobile. And DSP is something, you know, which would uh, render sound. So when you throw a bomb, CPU is something which work, work out the physics, right? That, you know, if the blast is coming from east side, the characters will have to fall at certain angle, right? You know, they don't have fall in the direction of the blast, but they fall in the direction away from the blast. Or, you know, direction where the waves are coming. So CPU will calculate the physics. It would direct GPU to render images in that particular direction. The tree should fall in a certain direction or a person should blow off, off in certain direction. And DSP would make certain sound which would go along with it. I have not yet talked about NPU, but network processing unit again, you know, is a chip which is quite similar to DSP. But, you know, it would do this augmented reality kind of things or artificial intelligence like of, uh, like thing that, you know, suppose a character, you know, if you have, it would figure out the difference between a bullet and a grenade and a rocket launcher if you are playing a war game video. And, you know, it would decide that, you know, what kind of damage it should do. So these things or these processors, they work in conjunction. Now, if you're writing a software program, then, you know, you need to know what kind of uh, speed do you have for your CPU, for your GPU, and for your DSP. You can't write a game which would work on, you know, only if you have i9 or some kind of an uh, Intel Xeon server, only then this game would work. Then, you know, then your boss would say that, you know, your design is no good, that, you know, my clientele will. And you know, fast rendering of image, you know, if a person looks to the left or right, my image should be changed very quickly. That all should be there. But on the other hand, I don't want you to use very expensive CPU or very expensive GPU or very expensive DSP. In other words, my CPU should not be very powerful or GPU should not be very powerful or DSP should not be very powerful because, you know, powerful things cost money. So now you have got two goals going in opposite direction. One is you want to write a software which works even if you have not very high powered uh, hardware, but on the other hand, you know, you want your graphics to be perfect, your sound to be perfect, and you know, your physics to be perfect. So to do this, 
a person who is writing a software always should have specs of GPU in mind, DSP in mind, and CPU in mind. That my CPU is i5, and it has got only so much of cache. It has got only so much of RAM. And you know, using this you know, kind of a restriction within those restriction, I would like to give a best game. And that person can be a great software writer only if he has perfect knowledge of how hardware works. You can't be a great software engineer without knowing the hardware, and you can't be a great hardware engineer without knowing how a software would work. So for that particular reason, you need to know the play between CPU, GPU, DSP, if time permits, we'll talk about NPU. Then there is field programmable gate array. We are also going to talk about that. In fact, let's talk about it right now. Where does FPGA come into picture? Now, FPGA, you may have heard about it a little bit in your digital logic design class. If you have not heard about it, then don't worry. So FPGA, is just like a sea of gates. And you know that you know any task can be done by connecting a large number of gates in a, a certain way. So you know you can make a circuit using NAND gates or NOR gates or AND gates or OR gates. And you also know that NAND gates and NOR gates are known as universal gates. So you can make them do anything. You can make a circuit using only NAND gates to realize a certain logic. And you know, even your most complicated CPU, even for a supercomputer, is finally made up of such gates. So such gates, when you put large number of them together, can perform a task. So now you know people are taking this a particular view that you know, uh, suppose I want to write a merge sort program. I think when you wrote a C program, I think one of the first few algorithms you learn is a merge sort programming. Like merge sort, bubble sort. I don't know whether you have done it or not. Have you done it? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so you have got this merge sort or bubble sort program. You say that, you know, doing it in uh, my CPU, it's taking certain amount of time because you know CPU is designed for a general purpose thing, right? So you, CPU can do anything you want to do, but you know it has got its own limitations. So you say that I would like to that program in a very log language. You must have heard about it in DLD. Have you done a little bit of uh, programming in very log? No, sir. No, sir, we haven't. Okay, so you in DLD, you have not learned about uh, uh, hardware description language. No. No. Okay, so one quick question. Uh, who taught DLD last year? Vinay, sir. Vinay, okay, sir. Vinay Palapit. Okay, fine. Doesn't matter. Uh, We'll do a little bit of that, you know, if required. So hardware description language or HDL is a programming language which is just like your C, but you know, it is designed in a specific way that you know there are electronic design automation tools would understand, just like you have got your C compiler. Similarly, there is EDA tools which understands your very log language, and it will convert your software program into electronics. So people write this merge sort programs and other things directly into Verilog. And you know, advantage is that you know it executes much faster than if it is written in software. Right now, you may not understand that you know how it would be faster or uh, what is the reason for it being faster than you know running through general CPU. And right now, I don't even expect you to know about it. But I would definitely uh, uh, make sure that you learn about it in this particular course. And by the time you are out of this course, you know you would have a perfect idea that you know why HDL is being used. Where can I? So whatever program you write in C, you can write in HDL. 
and you can you know uh, actually download it in FPGA boards which are available, and you know you can execute it, and you know the result would be much faster than your C program which is running through your I3 or I5 processor. Okay, so we will talk about that more uh, in future. Finally, you know, one more thing I would like to throw you. I'm throwing in a lot of information to you in this particular course or in this particular lecture because, you know, it is informal. So, you know, I'm allowed to wander here and there. And, you know, I hope that some of it would stick in your head. And when I actually start discussing during the regular course, you would remember that, okay, something like this was discussed in the beginning. So then you say that, you know, okay, CPU and GPU and BSP, why do you need so many different things? Why can't you make a powerful uh, central processing unit which can do everything? And you know what? CPU can do everything that GPU does. CPU can do everything that BSP does. CPU can do everything that FPGA or NPU does. And your question is, why you know not make a very powerful CPU and make like you know GPU and BSP and FPGA and you know keep on increasing components in your SOC? Well, the reason for that is simple. Your G GPU, DSP, NPU, they are special purpose things. So take example of your mobile phone. Right? This is your mobile phone. It has got everything. It has got CPU, it has got DSP, it has got GPU, it has got a little bit of FPGA. Uh, it may or may not have NPU depending on what model of phone you have. Now, your phone, like my phone at the moment, is doing nothing, right? It is idle. I'm, neither I'm talking on it, I'm not watching a film, I'm not watching a YouTube video. I hope you are also doing the same, not checking your social media account. So right now this phone is off. And you know, the phone is one thing or any device which is not connected to a power, wall power. They are known as mobile devices because I can put it in my pocket and take it anywhere with me. That is the advantage, right? You know, I don't have to look for a wall socket where I can plug in and start using it. But the disadvantage is that, you know, it has got limited amount of power. And what is that limited amount of power? Whatever is stored in the battery, my phone has to live on it for at least 12 to 18 hours or at 24 hours, depending on how much you use it. Because no matter how good your phone is, if you lose your battery within like four or five hours, nobody's going to use that phone because you know how where are they going to charge it every four or five hours? So what do they do in your mobile phone is that you know when your phone is doing nothing, which is like 70% of the time, only small part of CPU would be awake. Your DSP would be going to sleep, your GPU would be going to sleep. Your NPU, if you have it, will go to sleep. When I say go to sleep, means the power would be turned off. And only a small part of CPU would be awake. And all it would be doing is listening to signals coming from tower. So it would be periodically checking, say, once every second, once every two seconds. And second is a big time for a processor because, you know, processor's frequency is like one gigahertz. That means a billion times. It can do billion things in one second. So that means if you check it once and if you check it after the second number two, that means it rested for a billion cycles. Now it is waking up, checking something, again sleeping for a billion cycle. So very little power is used when my phone is like this. If I don't have that facility and you know every part of my mobile phone is on like DSP, if my CPU itself is very powerful and it contains all the functionality of DSP, GPU, FPGA, NPU, that power wastage would be a whole lot because unnecessary amount of circuitry would be on. Say my GPU and my NPU unit is 
mainly used for when I'm taking video or when I'm taking photograph. I'm not taking photograph. What's the point of keeping them alive or you know keeping them awake? So the main unit reason is power consumption. And the things which you are not using, you will turn it off. You know, so special purpose thing like GPU or DSP or NPU, you keep them as a separate chip. Now, you may know the use case. The second use case is like, you know, when you're taking a picture, that, right? you know, you're clicking a photograph. And now you have got this quote unquote beauty mode. So as soon as, or a night mode. So what does that suggest? You take a picture. And within like a fraction of a second, when the photograph is taken, the features are changed, it is smoothing over the blemishes on your face, or it is increasing the amount of light which is coming in with the night mode. In the beauty mode, it is changing your complexion from wheatish to you know white as a sheet or whatever color you like. All these things are done in your DSP and your AI unit. And, for, and your CPU is directing them or diverting the work to the respective thing. So all these processing units are the ones which are used in your processor. And if you are a software programmer, you will have to use all of them or some of them to write your program better. To write a better program, you need to know these things inside out. Now let's go a step further. Now this is a whole stack of things you will be studying, whether you are a CS guy or whether you're ICT guy, who is like, you know, I got some interest in electronics, some interest in system design. So when you look at it, here we are starting from device physics level. And, you know, we call it a solid state device. You know, you may not have, uh, any class in this particular thing. You took, you studied basics of electronics or BEC that deals with this area, which is known as the transistor level thing. If you go to a level higher in abstraction, you go to a gate level design. And for gate level, that is the course which was taught to you called as DLD, Digital Logic Design, so where you learned about this gate level designs. Then you come to registers and data paths and IO control and instruction set architecture. So these two things would be part of your computer organization. Then you come to an even higher level of abstraction, there will be operating system, system software, compiler design, firmware design, this would all be part of courses which will be taught as an operating system course or system software design course. A compiler course is, I believe, uh, an elective. And then finally, application software design, so that you know comes at the top of the stack. But you know, if you want to be a good software designer, you need to know the rest of the stack, at least up to uh, registered at data path level and instruction architecture level. And so this is computer science, and this is electronics and VLSI. And these a particular course, uh, computer system organization, it falls in the junction of computer science and electronics. So it is considered as part of both. So you can call it as IT course, and you can also call it electronics course. Uh, does anyone have any question up to this point? No, sir. Okay. Good. So let's. Sir. Yes. Sir, what is the use of FPGA? Okay. So FPGA has got many uses. First of all, you can design any hardware on FPGA, even your full processor. So, in fact, when people design a processor, there are two ways of putting it out in the market. One is like you know making a specific uh, chipset, you know where you pick particular gates and you know put them together, 
and you know make a and then you know make a mask and then you know go for fabrication. That is known as ASIC. And that is a time consuming thing and an expensive process. So it is something which is known as tailor made thing. Whereas FPGA, on the other hand, is a sea of gates. So imagine that you know you are given lots of dots in a piece of paper, and you connect the required dots and make a figure out of it, right? So you know that way you can quickly make a figure. But then you can say that you know you wasted a lot of dots. You know what are the use of other dots? You know you connected only so many dots in this particular grid of dots, and the rest of the dots you did not use. Well. Same way FPGA is known as quick and a dirty method. But you know, gates are lying in a row and a column wise. And you connect the required amount of gates together and make a circuit. So it is kind of wasteful that you know you didn't, if a million gate FPGA is given to you, you use only 100,000 gates. You wasted 900,000 gates. So you know, you say, okay, this is a wastage. But the advantage is it is quick. You got your chip right away. And you know, you can show it to someone for a demo. So if you are designing a hardware, just designing a chip by itself is no good. So, like you know, if Qualcomm is designing uh say Snapdragon, which is the latest one, it's 880. If they are designing a Snapdragon 880 uh SOC or system on a chip, which has got great processor inside. So then, you know, they don't first go out and make ASIC immediately. Software and hardware development will go in hand in hand. So as soon as this chip RTL is written using Verilog, they would port it on FPGA and then give it to the software people, people who are going to write operating system uh, for it or compilers for it. So those two developments will go together. So by the time this chip is ready in ASIC form, the operating system for it would also be ready, and then people would port things on the chip. So in short, FPGA is known as quick and dirty. Yes, uh, any question? So uh, in short, FPGA is a quick and dirty method in which you can port your HDL, your design for a chip onto this uh, thing. I think uh, since you've not studied Verilog, let me just give you an idea that you know how a Verilog would work. Suppose you have got an idea of a chip in mind. So you are supposed to design a traffic light controller. And you know, you are, suppose you want to make a small chip which would control your traffic lights. But you know, you don't know electronics that you know, you don't know how many gates to make or how many which gates to put together. You, know, you are more good in software. So for you, there is a great facility. They have developed this hardware description language in which you have to give only the behavioral description. Behavioral description means you are getting your input from the sensor that you know if this particular lane has got a lot of vehicles waiting, then convert the light from red to green. Then you convert the light from red to green. Other lanes, should, their light should be turning into red, whatever light was before that. Then you know you should wait for input from other signals that you know if their congestion increases beyond the congestion on the light which is green, then you know you should stop it. So, you know, all these things, you know, whatever ideas come into mind, you write that description in very log language. Just you can do in C language, you write the description in very log language. Now there are FPGA boards available. As soon as you write this RTL code, you can port it directly into FPGA. So that means it has converted into electronics. And actually, you can make a circuit right out of it. And you know, you can go and sell it to someone that here is my traffic light controller. With this, you know, you can, if you can connect appropriate connections and sensors and lights and everything, it would operate the signal system. So that is what FPGA is all about. Why FPGA is, I mean, I made a particular mention because at some point in this course, 
you are going to learn about machine learning. Now in machine learning, uh, again, you know, uh, just forgive me if you think I'm jumping too much, but you know, I mean, this some of the ideas would stick into your head and pick your curiosity. So now, you know, what is machine learning or artificial intelligence? People say that, you know, okay, I have got this mobile phone with me. I take picture of a cat or a dog. And then, you know, I would let my phone decide whether it is a dog or a cat. Now you may say, you know, is it very difficult? Well, if you come to think about it, it is quite difficult because there are so many different kinds of, there are so many different breeds of dogs. Some dogs do look like cat. So how do you distinguish between a dog and a cat? Well, you know, your first answer is that, you know, okay, uh, a cat has a nose which is flat and do dogs generally have a long nose. But then, you know, I would counter you by giving you a dog breed named Pug, P-U-G, which has got also a nose which is like flattened or a boxer, its nose is flattened. Then, you know, you go come to ears that, you know, uh, usually cats have ears which can be erect. And, you know, there are some dogs whose ears are also erect or some dogs who have got docked ears, so they are also erect. Then you go for a size that, you know, dogs are generally taller than cat, but then, you know, I will show you some breeds of dogs which are shorter than a cat. So, you know, it is a very complicated thing. So what you do is, what people thought about this is that, you know, they went to the very beginning, that how does a baby learn that this is a cat or a dog? Now, if you want to figure out whether it is a cat or a dog, a baby in the beginning doesn't know anything. So baby would not know whether there's a cat or a dog. Parents reinforce learning. They see cat or see this is a dog. And slowly the database builds up in baby's head. So very similarly, they have tried to do in electronics. So what they do is they create something which is known as a neural network. Then on neural network, there are certain inputs and there are certain outputs. So now the first thing you do is you train your neural network, just like you train a baby by showing a baby, a lot of dogs, a lot of cats, and you know, let the database build up in baby's head. You try to show your chip, a lot of photographs of dogs and cats. Now, initially, the guess would be like completely random because you know there is nothing in the head so uh, randomly something will be co called as a cat or something will be called as a dog when this idea goes through what your artificial intelligence chip or machine learning chip does is it breaks down the whole image into several small parts and then tries to learn through feedback first its answer is random this is a dog and you know you are showing it from a known database. So you immediately tell it that no, it is not a dog, it's a cat. So it would say, okay, what features were there? So he, it has said abstracted 100 features. So it would say, okay, this particular feature is making a big change. So like, you know, let's say tail. A cat has like, you know, a smooth tail and which is like, you know, usually down. But dogs generally, it is uh, kind of, Either it is docked or it is like, you know, rounded or it is curled or it has got a lot of hair on it. So then, you know, your neural network system would learn that, okay, I think tail is an important feature. Then slowly it would say, okay, shape of the mouth is an important feature. So it would start giving a particular note that, you know, okay, this particular feature has got a high precedence. That's how I learned that this is a cat or a dog. So just like a baby picks out, that this is a cat or a dog by looking at certain features. You know, sometimes the baby can go wrong. Sometimes even we can go wrong. Right? If, if they show me a very exotic breed of a dog, which may look just like cat, and I may look at certain features. I don't know how my brain works, but you know, I may say, oh, this is a cat. But you know, that person would say, no, it's a dog. And probably I would again feed it in my database. So same thing here. Now at each database to figure out whether the weightage of this feature is high or low, they have got a matrix multiplication program. 
and you know you will realize that matrix multiplication is the foundation of your graphics of sound of mpeg3 mpeg4 your uh, machine learning the foundation is matrix multiplication please remember my words so these things are made to give matrix multiplication very fast cpu can also do matrix multiplication but it is not specialized for that so it will take slightly longer time than dsp or gpu i mean in my uh, class in my research i've got a lot of students who have done experiments with cpu and you know for a cheap small uh, arduino or raspberry pi kind of board doesn't have luxury of having gpu or dsp or npu that is just a small cpu so cpu cannot do all the work it will take more time so the machine learning thing is also working on the basis of matrix multiplication to figure out the weightage of each feature and that matrix multiplication type is npu so to be very honest i had a chat with uh, arm engineers who are designing this npu that you know what's the difference between dsp and npu it's basically the same hardware and after some humming and hoing they say yeah but you know when you want to sell something it is not just the technical thing it is also what is there in people's mind what would sell and right now neural processing unit is a big bird so you know if you say we have got a separate npu people would be very happy that yeah i want to buy that thing so that is npu so this is all things how they would work you may have learned something you may have remembered something other things may have gone over your head doesn't matter don't worry now some last things you know before we close today's session things to remember we may or may not get time to discuss these things during the semester but you know i want you to remember this thing for rest of this semester and rest of your studies i have seen that most of the students have become exam oriented that you know the grades are important and you know uh, my uh, either admission will be determined by my grade or uh, job cut off will be determined by my cpi well that is all correct but you know once you get an entry into an interview what do they ask they will ask you what projects have you done so real learning comes from doing a project and i will in fact it is my desire to bring in students right from 2001 batch till 2017 or 18 batch and they would tell you what to the and you know all of them are in semiconductor industry either working on hardware or software and they would tell you the importance of doing a project because see most of the people know that okay you have got good cpi that means you are a hard working guy but you know you might be getting good grades because you remember well but can you think well that comes from doing a project then comes prepare peripheral skills they will not be taught to you as a part of class a or class b but they will be very useful so for example there are a lot of scripting languages like pickle or that is tcl or perl or python you should learn these languages very very useful i will give you an example one of my students baulik i think he was in 2015 batch right now he is in austin he is working for apple uh he is designing their memory modules he told me that first he joined nvidia right after his uh, btech he joined nvidia and you know he had to operate certain electronic design automation tools so he had to write a program and then you know it will go to tool a and then you know then you has to take it to tool b and tool c and tool d he said that you know i was sitting there and i said lot of people are wasting lot of time getting a result of this then massaging it in a certain way and putting it in tool number 2 and then you know getting the answer out of tool output out of tool number 2 and then again massaging it and putting it in a certain format putting it into 3 and so on so he said you know i write a tickle script 
or I mean, he used, I don't know whether he used Python or he used TCL, but he used one of those languages and he automated the whole process. So he said, you know, I did put it one and for the whole day, I would sit and read whatever I wanted to read and, you know, things would be done automatically. His manager was so pleased that, you know, he has done this thing because, you know, this is going to be useful for the whole team. And, you know, in fact, they made him, gave him like, you know, immediate promotion. So this peripheral skill, second peripheral skill, first is scripting languages you should learn. Second is Linux. You should know about it inside out. And when you learn Linux, please use command line prompts. Don't use YZVIC like you use in Windows. So make your <coughs> PC dual boot and start learning Linux because most of the people nowadays are learning Linux, I mean, are using Linux. Uh, be it Amazon, be it uh, all server-based things, all uh, things you know which are used like you know that is Amazon, Google, uh, and also all the EDA companies, all the semiconductor companies, they extensively use Linux. So please learn Linux. Use Ubuntu or any flavor of your choice, CentOS. Learn Linux. Third is. Be really, really good in presentations and English speaking skills. Uh, I've seen a lot of students. They don't perform well in interviews. And the reason for that is they don't have good command over language, so they can't express themselves. So an interview over so many years for past 20 years, I've been on both sides. I've been on the hiring side when I was in ARM and Cadence, and I was on the side of sending students. And from both sides I've seen, there are some very good students who are not selected because they can't express themselves. And so, for God's sake, do whatever you do. Please form a habit of speaking in English. I've seen that most of the Gujarati students, and I also am a Gujarati student, they feel that they have studied in a Gujarati medium school, so you know it's very difficult to learn English. But then you know, I also studied up to twelfth grade in a Gujarati medium school, so that is no excuse, because world doesn't care whether you studied in an English medium school or a Gujarati medium school or any vernacular medium school. Right now, the business works in English, and if you are not good in English, you are, you know, not very welcome. So with your friends, you try to speak in English. You listen to English news. You watch English movies. I mean, not too much of it, but a little bit of it. Fourth thing is, if you plan to go for higher studies, prepare for it now. I get a lot of requests for letter of recommendation. And this request come from students say, I took your IT 209 course, or I took your this course, I took your that course. Now, you know, you are one of 300 students or one of 400 students. How do I know what you are doing or what you did? You say, I got an A grade. Well, then all I can do is that you got an A grade. They want recommendation letter from a person who knows you very well. So your course instructor is, I mean, in a large class is not considered a very good reference. Why? Because, you know, how much time that, how much time did you spend with that particular course instructor? Not much. So you should start doing projects with people you like. That, you know, okay, I like particular professor, basically not professor, but you know, the professor and the areas of his or her uh, work. And, you know, I would like to do project with this particular professor. Then, you know, it would make sense to give a reference letter to you if you have done a project with me or any other professor. So you should pick out at least three, minimum three professors with whom you have worked in close uh, uh, cooperation. Only then they would give you a reference letter which would be worthwhile. So don't go in the end that, you know, you're not talked to anyone, you're never talked to me, and then, you know, you come at the last day and say, okay, I took your this course, so give me a reference letter. 
And even if I give you to be meaningless or to not hold much water, because as soon as I say that he was part of a large class or she was a part of a large class, then they would say, okay, then you know how well do you know that person? How would you know that person's work ethics? All you can say is he got his eight pointer, it was a nine pointer, 10 pointer, but that doesn't mean much. And finally, learn to network. That means most of you, you know, as long as you are a student, you say, okay, this is my study material. This is what I have to do. And my grades is everything. It is not going to work that way. Because in college, you know, you will get a major shock. That studying is not as organized as it used to be up to 12th grade. In 12th grade, you know, you have got a lot of exercises. You know, this is a particular chapter. There are 500 unsolved problems with solutions given. You do those 500 problems and, you know, the problem which would be asked in exam would be more or less of the same type and you can score 99 marks, 98 marks. In college and especially in my course, I want to find out how many students can think. So you will not get 500 unsolved problems and suddenly something is given to you. And you know, given to you, which is similar to the problem that you have solved and you know, you can score full marks in it. It doesn't work that way. In my exams, you will get problems which are, of course, based on the things which you have learned and you are taught, you have been taught in the class. But, you know, I want to see your ability to think. And in my class, if you get an A grade, it means something. If you get an AB grade, it means something. That, you know, if you get, get up to A, AB, or up to BB, it, that means you are good. So, learning to network has got importance in this one that, you know, you make a group of students and you study together. You will get more things done. Plus, you start being members of various clubs. You start interacting with your professors and faculty members. All these things would help you in your future life. So, for the last point, if I want to summarize it, I can say is that, you know, don't be a loner. It is not a 12th grade that I will sit myself closed in a room. Everything is with me that, you know, okay, everything is very organized. A chapter which is given in the book, I have to rot it. I've got 500 unsolved problems with answers. I will just do it and then, you know, the exam, the same question will be asked or similar question will be asked. Those things are gone. Now you cannot sit locked in your room and be a loner. You have to make networks. Network with other students, network with faculty members, network with even outside. People can help you get a job. Network with your seniors. So, okay, so this is all for day one. I've done a lot of talking. I always value your feedback. So, if you have any question, any idea, any suggestion, you can send me an email. Uh, I hope to read a lot of them and you know, try to answer as many as possible. If there are too many uh, questions on a similar type, then, then I would solve it. I would just refer to it in a lecture rather than giving individual answers because you know typing is also a problem. But you know, all the best to you. We will be doing our organized uh, studies from next uh, class. All the best. I would like you to be present before the class. You know, there are certain disciplines which I like and which I maintain. Do not come to class late. Always be there two minutes before the meeting because it is a very, very bad manners to come after either your advisor or your professor or your boss in industry. That person should be the last one to come and you should join before that. So thank you very much. It was nice talking to you guys. Uh, excuse and me, sir. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.